Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I am Priya Natarajan, the current director of the Frankie Program um, in Science and the Humanities at Yale, which is the flagship interdisciplinary program. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the final talk in our Understanding the Nature of Inference series that we've been hosting at the Frankie Program, exploring inferential models, reasoning, and experiments across disciplines. We've had a really rich series of talks, exciting talks that have addressed issues relating to direct causation and correlation and how multiple modes of inquiry help us make sense of the world and make inferences from it. So I invite you all to today's talk with the intriguing title, Inference in a Non-Conceptual World, by the wonderful speaker today, uh, Professor Brian Catwell-Smith. But before I introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening, I would like to first recognize our benefactors, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, whose generosity in funding interdisciplinary activities at Yale has made all our radical academic silo busting activities at the Frankie program possible. I would also like to thank the John Templeton Foundation for funding this program of activities, including this colloquium and discussion series. Their support has permitted us to explore in this series a novel format, a colloquium by a distinguished speaker followed by deep engagement with an additional leading thinker after the colloquium on a separate day, in this case, tomorrow afternoon at the same time. This unique format has enabled serious engagement while giving us some time to reflect and digest new concepts that we learn from the colloquium speaker, while also exposing us to highly relevant alternate intellectual points of view from the discussant the following day. I am also required to kindly remind those assembled that we are recording this event and that all participants' videos and microphones will remain muted. If you wish, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature. On to today's speaker, Professor Brian Cantwell-Smith. Brian Cantwell-Smith is the Reed Hoffman Professor of Artificial Intelligence and the Human, as well as being Professor of Information, Philosophy, Cognitive Science, and the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology, and a Senior Fellow at Massey College at the University of Toronto. He actually spoke to us in person about artificial intelligence, the challenges, the wins and the challenges at our program just before the onset of the pandemic. So we are absolutely delighted to invite him again. He received his degrees, all his degrees, in fact, uh, from my favorite undergraduate institution, MIT. So here I have to express my loyalty to MIT. And from 81 to 96, he was a principal scientist at Xerox PARC um, and an adjunct professor of philosophy at Stanford. He was the founder of the Center for the Study of Language and Information at Stanford University, um, was really ahead of the game in understanding that information was going to start playing an incredibly important role in society, culture, creation of new knowledge, and really the frontier of technology as well. He was a founder and first president of the Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility and president for the Society of Philosophy and Psychology, and from 1996 to 2001, he was a professor of cognitive science, computer science, and philosophy at Indiana University. And from 2001 to 2003, he was the Kimberly Jenkins University Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and New Technologies and professor in, of, uh, in the departments of philosophy and computer science at Duke University. So you get the sense that uh, Ryan has had his foot in multiple camps so multiple feet and multiple camps uh, throughout his academic career. So if there is someone whose intellectual interests cannot be siloed, uh, it is him. He's exemplar of the interdisciplinary scholarship that we stand for. And uh, Professor Smith moved to the University of Toronto in 2003, uh, initially to serve as the Dean of the Faculty of Information and has stayed there since. And our distinguished conversant tomorrow afternoon uh, is Professor Joseph Rouse from Wesleyan University, and his primary research interests are in the philosophy of science, the history of 20th century philosophy, interdisciplinary science studies, and the social theory of practices. I'll give a much more detailed introduction to him before our session tomorrow. Without further ado, I am um, turning the floor over to Professor Brian Cantwell-Smith. Welcome, Brian. It's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Priya, and um, and thanks to you and to and to Ty and to Guy. Um, 
and um, to the um, Rankies and to the Templeton Foundation and so on and so forth, all the people for making this possible. And then also thank you all of those of you who are attending um, for a chance to have this conversation, because I really hope it will be a, a kind of open-ended conversation. What I want to convince you of, if um, if I have a, a chance, is of an orientation, not of an answer um, to a whole, and I think the orientation opens up all kinds of questions to which, um, as far as I know, none of us yet have answers. So, so that's what I hope to talk about. Um, there are four parts to this, or actually five in a way. I'm going to talk about conceptual representation first, and then the conceptual world second, and then uh, non-conceptual representation third, and the non-conceptual world fourth, and then an epilogue on explainability. Um, I want to make one remark before we start um, about AI and contemporary AI. Um, I, I won't be talking all that much about AI, but some towards the end. But one thing that's true is I've been in and around AI for a long time. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty ancient. Um, I wrote my first uh, big AI program in 1968. Um, and there have been a lot of changes since then, needless to say, there was the first wave enthusiasm and then long periods of AI winter and a lot of uh, different weather in there and a resurgence of second wave AI and stuff. What's interesting to me and sobering is that today, so for example, when I teach classes, I'm just finishing one up this fall, the word AI, the moniker AI, but also the word artificial intelligence, mean statistical generalizations over massive amounts of data. That's what the students just think this is. Um, a particular kind of data too, corpuscular non-narrative data, the sort of data that can go into databases or else decontextualize text strings. And as I've argued in a recent book, um, there's no real serious attempt to get these systems to understand what they're talking about. And I think, um, there's sort of pure, there's a wonderful phrase of um, of uh, Timur, um, Gibru and others um, called statistical um, parrots. That's how they characterize these systems as statistical parrots. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I don't think there's any real semantics to these today's systems. And some people think that with enough syntax, you get semantics, which I think is about as wrong as thinking that if you travel fast enough in strange loops on two dimensions, you're going to end up in a third dimension. Um, so I think AI at the moment is in a very particular and rather narrow conception. That's not how it started. Um, when I was at MIT in the 70s, um, you know, a lot of people were inspired by the golem, the, 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 the myth from, from, uh, from, from, from Jewish mystical history in a way that the idea was that man was created in God's image was a recursive plain, because if man was in creating God's image, then that meant man could create in God's image as well and stuff. A lot of the early um, pioneers of AI at MIT, like um, Marvin Minsky, one of the founders of the field, Gerald Sussman, um, Joel Moses, who went on to be president of the university, admitted, not necessarily publicly, that they'd been inspired by the Golem myth as, as, as children. And the idea was that we would understand understanding, we would understand the human condition, we would understand our place in the universe and how, where we came from and so on and so forth. Marvin Minsky proposed we buy a church and put a computer on the altar. Um, now that was a little imperialist, but there was, I think, a, a, a grandeur to that original vision, which I think has been lost. And I think, um, I think, the aim of this talk is not to indict current models of AI, but when I talk about AI, I, 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 you should know that I come from that tradition, and I'm not referring to the current narrow view. I'm actually referring to things that might allow us to move from the current narrow view to a much bigger, broader, maybe more inspiring vision. Okay, at any rate, part one, conceptual representation. Um, so when philosophers particularly talk about the content of a representation, they refer to something like what it means or how it presents the world as being. So the content might be that tanks are driving up in front of the Supreme Court or God knows what it is. Um, we could spend a, a semester on the relationship between um, what something means and how it presents the world as being. Um, but I don't need to... Uh, I don't need to do into that. I just think for the moment, a sort of informal notion of meaning um, will do. In 1982, Gareth Evans, 
a philosopher at Oxford introduced the notion of non-conceptual content. Now, non-conceptual content, if anything is obvious, it's defined in opposition to the notion of conceptual content. And so the question of what intent conceptual content was, and that kind of triggered a, a whole debate. Basically, I'm going to talk about it more, but conceptual content was the kind of content that everybody assumed up until then um, and uh, underlies every form of logic that you have ever imagined, um, um, including fuzzy logic. I mean, it's just the sort of model um, model on which all these formal systems are based. Okay, what, what is it in particular, conceptual content? Very roughly, a conceptual representation is a representation that represents the world in terms of objects, properties, relations, sets, attributes, and so on and so forth. Um, as in logic, as in model theory, as in classical AI, GoFi, as John Hoagland called it, um, as in XML, and so on and so forth. It's just an extraordinarily widespread view about how the world is and how, what it is to represent it. Um, what else, in fact, could it be? Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to say something about how conceptual content has been theorized. Two philosophers in particular um, have written in deep ways about the notion of conceptual content. Um, people of enormous intelligence. Um, Gareth Evans, who I mentioned, who introduced the notion of non-conceptual content, he was an enfant terrible at Oxford. Um, he died at 30, 34, I think, um, having done a huge amount of work. Um, his idea of conceptual content was a representation that's algebraically structured. So I'm just going to share the screen here for a second. Um, um, he he articulated what he called the generality condition. Basically, a representation is conceptual if it says A is F, you know, that somebody is tall or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the storm is going to be intense or something like that. It's conceptual if and only if the system that's representing that is capable of entertaining the thought or representing or whatever, not only that A is F, but also that B is F and C is F and so on and so forth for any other B and C of which it has a conception, and also that A is G and A is H and so on for any A, G and H of which it has conception, modulo various condition, appropriate conditions. So, you know, beans are green might be okay. Dreams are green, famous sentence of Chomsky's doesn't quite fit because dreams don't have color. So that's an appropriate condition, but the logical structure takes that form. Um, note that this generality condition is not framed in terms of syntax, but it lends itself to being read syntactically, which is to say if a representation has the form of A is F or F of A um, syntactically, then that system is capable of writing down G of A or H of A or H of B or whatever. Since contemporary AI reads everything syntactically, in fact, it's defined all kinds of words, including semantics, to be words of syntax. That's a discussion point. Um, this conception of conceptuality is very uh, fits swimmingly with current conceptions of AI and so on and so forth. So a lot of people in AI just think that this. Um, that Evans' generality condition applies to their structures directly. John McDowell, perhaps one of the most important philosophers in the last 50 years, um, um, has a different definition of being conceptual. He says that a representation is conceptual if it transparently represents the world as it is, i.e. it fits into a judgment about the world, not a complete judgment about the world because there's no such judgment, that would be too big, but a judgment about a complete world, in the sense the world is a whole. Um, on the face of it, McDowell's characterization is much less syntactic. It doesn't have to do with the structure of the representation itself. And also, to be honest, I don't think McDowell's characterization is anything that anyone in AI or any system in AI is capable of, of meeting, because it has to be about the world. But they're not exactly the same. So let's turn to part B, sorry, part two uh, about the conceptual world. Why are these two characterizations of conceptual thought to be sort of the same, or at least comparable, or at least compatible? The reason they're viewed as the same, I think, by most people, and in fact, a lot of people don't distinguish between these two characterizations, 
I think the reason they're thought to be compatible is because of an ontological assumption that underlies people's understandings of them. Um, and an ontological assumption being an assumption about the structure of the world, not a structure of representation or thought, but the structure of the world itself. And um, that basically representations that are structured according to this generality condition of Evans represent the world as it really is. So I'm going to extend ordinary usage and use the word conceptual, not just for representations, but for the world thereby represented. And I will say that a conceptual world is the familiar world in a way to our imaginations of objects, properties, relations, sets, and stuff. Um, that the world itself consists of objects exemplifying properties, standing in relations, grouped together in sets, exemplifying properties with attributes, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so setting Evans and McDowell's definitions aside, I'm going to actually take conceptual in my usage as any content that has this ontological character, any content that represents the world in terms of object properties, relations, and so on and so forth. Um, now, this assumption that that's what the world likes, that that's what the world is like, is extraordinarily widespread. Um, and it's... Um, so widespread that in fact, it's difficult with students to actually motivate them or enable them or something, lead them to believe that anything else might even be possible. Um, I want to point to a wonderful paper of, of Jeffrey Nunberg, who in fact passed away just recently on the rise of information. Jeffrey's an extremely smart guy. He's such a smart guy that it's actually sometimes difficult to figure out that his papers are as profound as they are. Um, but he wrote a paper called Farewell to the Information Age, which, but if we don't get to the farewell, as first of all, he starts about actually when did the information arise? He's tracing the notion of information. When did it actually enter our conceptions? Uh, Priya pointed out that information is a hugely important notion now, underlies all kinds of technical projects, scientific projects. Um, but he wants to know sort of when was it invented, as it were. Um, <clears throat> And he goes back to the to through history to the rise of print, basically, when print became, in fact, a common form of public discourse. And his, his, his sense is that print led to the idea of snippets of text being extractable and recombinable in ways that actually could then convey content about the world, like the temperature is 96 degrees or... Um, you know, pine trees are green or whatever it might be. Um, and his characterization of information is that it was the idea that the nature of the world is such that it can be reduced to these corpuscular, compact little bits of quote unquote information, right? In fact, Jeff's, uh, Jeff's such a colorful guy. He, um, I once asked him, I, I don't know if this is in print or not, but it's what, what in fact information was. And he said, oh, information, that's what happens when you take a book and you shake it by the spine so hard that all the words fall out. And I think that's a good way to remember his, his sense that it's, it's the sort of erosion of any sense that narrative is the locus of our, our understanding. And instead that, that our claims about the world are in fact coming these little bits. There are other assumptions underlying this notion of information too, that the properties or concepts and stuff that these bits of the world exemplify are uniform across all, all, all instances. So all pine trees, not that they're all the same, but in being a pine tree, their pine tree-ness is uniform across all pine trees um, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, so that you could in fact have pine tree as the type of a plant in a database or something like that. Um, Brian, I have a quick yeah. question. Yes. But this, this kind of getting to the essence of the pine tree nest, right? Sort of the right. essential folia, does it always imply a reduction, reductionism? Well, it, boy, I wish I had a bottle of whiskey and I could pour virtual bottles, glasses of whiskey around. Um, it doesn't imply reductionism. I mean, first of all, reductionism is not itself technically particularly well-defined. One version of reductionism is that there's a basic foundational set of 
fundamental primitives, like physical primitives or something like that, and that um, you can build everything up out of them. This assumption, which I don't necessarily have a good name for, but it's not that. It, you might have, you know, midwife in a database or, you know, um, um, user-friendly as a characterization of a, of a system. Um, and you'd still think that user-friendly is a, is a sort of formal concept in the sense that it can be applied to something without actually thinking you can reduce any of the concepts to any others. So you could have a gazillion. You could have every word in the dictionary in there. Um, so it's not actually reductionist in the classic sense. It does have a bit of character of reduction of everything to these corpuscular bits, but not to an underlying level out of which they're assembled. So that's just an important distinction. Um, Thank you yeah, for that clarification. Okay, so 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 let's turn to non-conceptual representation. Um, as I say, it was introduced by uh, Gareth Evans in 1982. He's an enfant terrible of Oxford. I actually knew him in, uh, at MIT as a graduate student by coincidence and by my luck. Um, and he strode. I would meet him at two in the morning. I mean, not by plan. I would just run into him at two in the morning in Cambridge, and he would be striding around. And he thought Cambridge, Mass, was not a big enough place to do philosophy because there wasn't enough place for long walks in the middle of the night. Um, but anyway, he introduced the notion of non-conceptual representation. Now, because it was Evans, when he said non-conceptual representation, he was obviously characterizing it as non-conceptual with respect to his own definition of conceptuality. So it was the algebraic, you know, some kind of algebraic combination of parts, A is F, B is H, and so on and so forth, not to McDowell's. His introduction of the notion of non-conceptual content led to quite a debate about what non-conceptual is, non-conceptual content is. Um, the fact that it's negatively defined doesn't help. There's a question of whether you could have non-conceptual judgments in thought or only in perception. You could have a question of whether they just occurred in action. There was a question of whether creatures that don't have conceptual powers, like simple animals and stuff, can actually exhibit, can actually have a non-conceptual judgment and so on and so forth. What are some examples, though, to give you a feel? Evans had this example of being in this study late at night, and there being a thinking he's completely alone, and there's a step on the floor, um, unmistakable step on the floor right behind him, and he freezes in terror. Now he knows exactly where that footstep happened, right? It's just his his imagination is riveted, but he doesn't have conceptual resources with which to describe that space. It's not like 137.6 degrees to my right and. 2.1 meters behind me or something like that. It, it just wasn't, it wasn't given to him in conceptual form. And yet it, um, and yet it was, it had content and it was very precise. Um, similarly, if I'm teaching tennis, which God knows you don't want to have happen, but at any rate, suppose I tell someone to hit their second serve, suppose their, their second serve is going out and I say, look, you're hitting it too hard. Just hit it at the speed at which paper is ejected from the big copier in the office of your department or something. It's not clear, I mean, that's a speed, and you know that the paper is coming out of the copy at a certain speed, but you don't know what speed that is in any way that, you know, like miles an hour, and even if it did, it's not clear you would be able to hit a serve at that many miles an hour. It's that form of understanding of speed that you have both for papers ejected from copiers and for, for tennis serves. They're not, they're not conceptually formulated. Um, Adrian Cousins, a, a philosopher who was a postdoc of mine, way back when, um, in the 80s, I guess, he got a PhD in Oxford and he was stopped, he rode a motorcycle um, late at night. So maybe this late at night is a theme of this talk. He was stopped by the police um, and uh, they hauled, hauled him up and said, look, do you know how fast you were going? And Adrian said, well, in one way I know and in one way I don't know, which I don't think was a good thing to say to police. But what he meant was he knew how fast he was going around the corner. It was wet and it was, Sandy, and he knew that he could go only that fast before skidding out. He could probably do it again and with a very small margin of error, repeat the same velocity. But it was not given to him conceptually. He didn't know how many kilometers per hour he was going and whether he was over the speed limit. I probably knew he was over the speed limit. But, but the point is, his sense of that speed was not conceptually um, articulated, and so on and so forth. Evans argued that a great deal of our knowledge, especially perceptual knowledge 
is in this um, non-conceptual form. Now that notion of non-conceptual content of Evans did drive a bit of a wedge through Evans and McDowell. Um, a, a wedge not well understood. Um, for example, suppose you go to a furniture store and you are with your partner and uh, and you say to them, look, hey, shall we buy those curtains? And the, your partner says, no, look, that red won't go with our sofa. Now, what does that red refer to? It refers to a shade of red. Um, there are different shades of red. You know, some might be might connote blood and occult ceremonies and burgundy wine. Another might connote lipstick and Orlan sweaters and Muffy at a prep school dance. For Evans, those are different judgments. Um, and the differences matter as regard conceptuality because they differ. Those differences matter with respect to conceptuality because how it is that those difference, differences manifest in your mind is not conceptually explicable to you. So th that judgment, that red is whatever, not the right one, is not a conceptual judgment on Evans' part. For McDowell, it's a different judgment too, but with respect to the defense of conceptuality, he doesn't care because that's a judgment about the nature of the world, which is given to you in your understanding of the world. So he thinks that's a fine conceptual judgment. So cracks started to appear in this whole debate, um, which I'm not gonna go into. I want to push, though, on the notion of non-conceptual content, because if we go deeper, I think we start to open stuff up in ways that touch contemporary AI and possibilities for inference and stuff. Okay, so part four, the non-conceptual world. I myself have never believed that the world au fond was conceptual. It may have stemmed from my misspent youth um, being... Um, um, taking place in the Canadian North. Um, um, so, so I used to go paddling around in whitewater rivers. Um, and I just don't think there are objects out there. I mean, of course there's some objects, there's rocks, but, but if we're talking about re-identifiable particulars under a category, you know, what category rock exactly is this? And how many rocks are there there? The thing underneath the water on the right, is that one or is it 17 or is that bedrock? Um, if you're gonna characterize rocks, there's no sort of natural boundary between the rocks and pebbles and sand and God knows what all. Um, one of the things that you have to do in paddling whitewater is you've got to um, go into the, into the arrow of a V of dark water pointing away from you. Um, and your life is often at stake if you do this wrong. Um, but how many V's are there in this picture? Um, I don't know. Um, um, it, 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 if you're paddling through this maelstrom of spray and waves and rocks and clouds and all this kind of stuff, there's no way to individuate. I mean, you may have enormous skill, but there's no way to individuate what's going on in ways that conceptual representations require. Um, I think the way conceptual representations work is different from how they are classically conceived. And Priya, this actually gets a little bit at your idea about whether this whole view of conceptual representation is, is reductive. Um, my sense is that conceptual content informs a form of abstraction over a fundamentally profuse richness in the underlying world, that it's essentially a conceptual achievement to box and 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 construct categories and so on and so forth in order to bring things out there under a regimen of intelligibility, um, and um, that that's sort of the the, the the norm on conceptual representation is to render the world intelligible by abstraction. Um, now, how does this work? Um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to actually put up a another slide. No, you'll forgive. This is a waterfall plot for people who know about such things. It doesn't matter. Suppose this um, suppose this was um, a sort of topographic set of sli vertical slices through a, a landscape at the edge of a lake or something like this. Um, and then suppose somebody says, look, um, we should go up one of the two ridges towards the left end of this picture. What are they referring to by the two ridges? You know, one possibility is that those are the two ridges they're referring to. Another possibility is that they're 
the left two are the ones that they're referring to. And I think the one on the right is, is different from what it was that the person on the right um, thought and so on and so forth. Um, so in other words, the, the category ridge, the property of being a ridge here is being imposed by an epistemic mind on an underlying world, which is in fact much richer than in fact those categories can in fact do justice to. Um, another example, there's an artist um, by the name of Adam Lowe, uh, a, a good friend of mine, who, and we've talked about what the world's like, and, and uh, he painted this picture. This is meant to be a realistic picture, but in the following sense, that if our perception renders the world's richness intelligible by our packaging it up and labeling it and categorizing it and smoothing the boundaries and so on and so forth, he couldn't paint a picture of what the world was like and to make any point because our perceptual apparatus would be looking at the picture and it would just construct the picture in categories and smooth out the boundaries and so on and so forth. Then we just look like a picture. So he's not an algebraist, but to put this in algebraic terms, if you assume that perception computes F of a scene, what he's painted here is a conception, his conception of F to the minus one of that scene. In other words, this differs from reality by the amount by which we, in fact, smooth out reality in order to fit it into our conceptual scheme, so that when our perception sees this, it's actually given to us in our judgment as something like the raw material with respect to which we see the world in general. And um, what's interesting about this is I can completely read this picture. I don't know if you can, and I apologize, it's probably not the best on this um, on Zoom, but I'll just point out some things. There's a door over here with some lumber inside and a, and, a, and, a, and a step ladder leaning over and stuff. You can sort of tell that. Down here, there's a pail. That's not too hard to see. On the right hand, um, um, what's it called anyway? The right hand side of the doorway, there's a mobile phone in a 1980s kind of mobile phone um, anchored to the right hand post there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a box, yeah, in there inside the room with lots of sticks of kindling size wood and so on and so forth. And over here is a person crossing over to, to, um, and actually to pick up the phone, it turns out from other aspects of this picture and so on and so forth. Um, you don't necessarily read these things as door and pail and box and person and so on and so forth and telephone immediately. But what he's sort of claiming in this picture is we actually do do that kind of classification and categorization on inputs. And one of the things that's sobering about AI is when AI first put television cameras on systems back, you know, 150 years ago when I was young, people were astounded by the messiness of the world that the cameras, that were the camera outputs because they thought that in fact, the camera was looking at like nice scenes of, you know, nice uh, scenes of vases of, flowers on tables or something like this, um, still life. <coughs> and it was a mess. It was a mess. And people were astounded that, oh my God, we we, we deal with this mess? Um, so, so the point is this, this orientation says that, look, the fact that in what philosophy actually calls our natural attitude, the fact that we take the world to be conceptual, to be consisting of objects and properties and categories and stuff, um, that's not how it actually is in and of itself. It's a human achievement. The fact that it looks like it is that way, and in fact, a lot of philosophy has been distracted into thinking that it just is that way aboriginal, is because that, in fact, has been processed by the very cognition that we're trying to understand. So, okay, so suppose I tell this to students and they say, well, what else could it be? Now, it's hard to answer that in language, especially in intellectual contexts like AI courses and philosophy courses and so on and so forth. In intellectual contexts, such as science philosophy and so on and so forth, in which people assume that language is conceptual in the sense that we talked about before. It would not be as hard to convey in a sense, in a, in a classroom or a community or something of people who were not themselves scientists or philosophers or AI people and stuff. If it was a, 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 a you know, class of poets or something like that, it would be easier, I think, to get them to realize that in fact, the world doesn't come chopped up in this corpuscular way that 
Nunberg um, talked about. <laughs> so how can I convey to you what the world might be like? Well, I want to make one suggestion. I'm going to make other suggestions before the end of this talk. And this first suggestion is just by way of op prying open this, this, this possibility. I'm not trying to put too much weight on it. But in a 1964 book called Individuals, uh, Peter Strassen introduced the notion of a feature. I mean, not exactly introduced, but I mean, developed the notion of a feature as something more basic and less committing, less ontologically committing than a property as something that could be exemplified in space and time, um, manifested in space and time, without actually needing an object for its exemplification. <coughs> Excuse me. So suppose I say it's raining, or we say it's foggy. Everybody knows that there's no it that is foggy, or no it that's raining. It's a kind of linguistic, it's actually called the weather it in linguistics. It's an it that doesn't refer. Um, but, but, but the idea of features is that, look, the features are just manifested in absolutely rich ways throughout the world. Um, cross-cutting and in vortices and so on and so forth without actually requiring object identities underneath them. One way to imagine this is to imagine falling overboard in a storm at sea, surrounded by nothing but crashing waves and stinging spray and undulating currents and so on and so forth, as far as the eye can see, and then subtract you so there are no objects there at all. I think that, in fact, the world of physics... Now, she is a physicist, so, um, so I look forward to her... Um, Coming in is, I actually think that's kind of what the world is like according to physics. Um, you might not think that it's that way because physics, in fact, often talks in terms of objects. You know, there's a mass of three kilograms traveling at this four meters per second off slides of a tail a meter high. Where does it land? And so on and so forth. Um, the various objects in this situation, a mass of three kilograms, a table, and so on. Um, but those objects are not ontological commitments of physics. Those objects are epistemic practices of doing physics, the theoretical enterprise, so that we can, in fact, work out our equations. But the equations don't quantify over the objects. They quantify <coughs> over the measures of the properties or features that, in fact, are exemplified. Um, and even if you think about the gravitational law, um, G times m1 times m2 divided by r squared, I think, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things you do in your first year physics class, at least I did um, 150 years ago, was you prove that, in fact, you can treat masses as point masses at the location of the center of gravity for purposes of calculating gravitational attraction. But that's not the ontological commitment of the physics underlying it. The ontological comm commitments of physics underlying it is that, in fact, mass is the you know, it's a density field spread out over a region. And if you really wanted to express the law of gravity in a way that actually didn't make this epistemic assumption for the convenience of physicists, you would have to express the law of gravity as a double, triple integral, and so on and so forth. Because there aren't objects in physics, I think that's right. And I actually don't think there are many objects in science either. Um, so, um, so that will uh, generate a lot of cortisol, I suspect, in many uh, uh, audience members. Um, but I think that idea, I mean, it goes with field theoretic interpretations of physics more too. That idea that maybe you could make sense of physics as a kind of characterization of features placed continuously in the world, the fact that that might be intelligible suggests that features might be an intelligible way of taking the world to be, which means that in fact, conceptual ontology isn't necessarily the only way to take the ontological structure of the world. And that's really why I want them here. However, features are problematic too. Um, because in fact, the whole assumption of features like in field theoretic interpretations is that the feature is the same feature that's exemplified in lots of different places and so on and so forth. Um, so it's just a step towards relinquishing the, the grip of the conceptual ontology as a presupposition for how the world is structured. Um, I think a better way that we can go, or a way that we can go deeper a little bit is to see how conceptual and non-conceptual representation, okay, the two epistemic practices we talked about, 
might fit into a metaphysical or ontological picture of this sort of a world of surpassing stupefying um, richness and operate as kinds of abstraction over it. Um, so four points. First point is that this is not, and this is another form of reductionism that this is not, to go to Priya's great question. It is not a view that the world is built up from atoms or elementary pieces or ultimate constituents of our ontological life, and that in fact, complex or high level or something objects are in fact assemblages of lower levels. It's more like a Jamesian blooming, buzzing, confusion conception of the world, but not in the sense in which James is often understood, it's that the blooming, buzzing, confusion is under undifferentiated kapok. Rather, what I'm trying to get at is an idea that the world is sort of infinitely heterogeneous, stupefyingly complex, and that we navigate and wrestle it into comprehensible form in order to make our way in our, you know, in our paltry, resource-limited lives. Um, so another point, one merit of this view that conceptual ontology is an epistemic achievement on top of a world of surpassing richness is that it provides a way to account for the most important insight, I think, and commitment underlying science studies, underlying feminist epistemology and so on and so forth. The concepts are normative and not just concepts, but objects. They are the locus of value. They're culturally relative, all these kinds of stuff. How does it make room for that? Because in fact, what it suggests is that a conceptual abstraction of the world, so a conceptual judgment is true when the thereby abstracted situation, what you take the ridge to be and so on and so forth, satisfies the norms, the dynamic norms governing the lives of the creatures who perform it. So if um, Priya is a geologist and I'm a mountain climber and I climb a peak in the Klawani Wilderness in the Yukon, where there's a uh, Mount Robson, I think is 19,000 feet. And I say, oh, look, I've climbed the highest peak in, uh, you know, or whatever. This is the last peak over 8,000 meters or something. Uh, it probably isn't 7,000 meters, something like that. It doesn't matter. I'm a philosopher, so I don't need to deal with pesky facts. Um, if I say I've climbed all of the 7,000 meter peaks, and Priya says, no, look, you haven't because you're on this peak, but over there about seven meters to the right, it dips a little bit and then there's another little rise. And so that technically is a peak and you haven't been there. Now I could say, look, that's not what I mean by peak. That's not the category peak that I'm using for my climbing. And it might be a category peak that she's using for her geological survey or something like this. But the point is that how to understand my category of peak is with respect to mountain climbing and the norms that govern mountain climbing and so on and so forth. Um, this is what the feminist epistemologists, I think, are, are on about and correctly so. But, that, Ryan, yeah. quick question. Yes. But yes. there needs to be a consensus, right, on the definition of peak, even amongst just the mountain climbers. Well, or do you think the, a definition of a peak to be some part of objective reality that cannot be contested by anyone? Well, I, I, I um, lo, there be lawyers. Um, I actually don't think that there are, I mean, there, the structure of, of agreement and, and consensuality and communion and so on and so forth, that's a huge topic in science studies as to how that stuff gets worked out. There was a famous case of a racehorse which crossed, and as to which, which horse run the, won the race. And there was one horse and its nose looked like it was further ahead than the one behind. But the one behind, it was like an inch behind or something, the rider argued that it had won the race because in fact there was spittle coming out of the nostril of the horse that was behind and the spittle was continuous with respect to the that horse and that the spittle crossed the finish line before the nose of the other one did. And so that constituted that horse winning. And it went to court. I mean, it went to court as you could imagine such things. I think the second horse won actually, but it doesn't matter who won, it's that, there has to be good enough agreement for practices to work. And I think it's 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 just not true that um, categories in general get resolved absolutely. There are there's politics, there's politics. And uh, 
Um, and, you know, sometimes there's been really pernicious, pernicious politics behind these judgments, you know, who's a person and stuff, who gets to vote, you know, right now with respect to whether, in fact, it's illegal to put a pregnant woman in prison because you're putting two people in prison. You know, that's that category is absolutely not well agreed and so on and so forth. So there be politics, I think. Um, okay. But, 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 the, but the point is, this is this is a huge this is a huge issue in, I mean, it's something we could talk to, to Joe Rouse about tomorrow. The sort of politics of the net, of the negotiation of conceptual agreement and so on and so forth in different fields. Um, a big topic, I think. Um, um, Thank you. What I think here really is just that the, the metaphysical picture here, that in fact, the concepts and categories and stuff are abstractions in terms of which we try to fit reality is that, um, okay, are they out there in the objective world? Well, here's the thing. It's generally accepted in philosophy that semantics needs naturalizing. We need an account of semantics of how reference works and how thought works and so on and so forth. What I'm saying here is that ontology, in the sense of conceptual ontology, what an object is, that needs naturalizing too. Because the process of abstraction that underwrite the grouping and individuation into individuals and so on and so forth, which is essential to our understanding of cognition, are no less mysterious and no more secured by a mechanistic or causal scientific worldview, no more autonomously integrable with results in contemporary science, than any other of the challenges and features of intentionality. So for example, if an amoeba splits, is that two new amoeba or is one of them the same one or is it one that is duly instantiated in the world? If you have a redwood tree and there's all kinds of fronds, is that what they're called growing up out of the roots? And some of these things are can be 30 feet tall and so on and so forth. Are those lots of different redwood trees or the same redwood tree? You know, science remarkably doesn't care about such things, I think. Because I don't think, as I said before, I don't think science is actually committed to, to conceptual ontology. Um, and I think to assume, as so much of philosophy and logic and XML and so on and so forth, assume that the world of objects, properties, and so on exists independently of us and objectively and so on and so forth, is essentially to suggest that the world is autonomously conceptual. And that's an especially pernicious way of succumbing to what's called the myth of the given in philosophy. Um, um, but, but and, and this is an important but, and it's really, really tough to convey. Um, on this picture, conceptual content, okay, the epistemic nature of conceptuality, so the nature of, that I talked about in the conceptual representation part of the talk, not the conceptual world part of the talk, and it's the conceptual representation part that's relevant to logic, involves loss. That's what abstraction means, throw away. It, you throw away vast amounts of detail. Why? In order to support generalization and long distance inference. So for example, um, one thing I learned when I moved to California is in New England, if you wander around in the countryside and you get lost, if you wanna find a road, you go down to the bottom of the valleys because that's where the roads are. In California, when you're wandering around outside San Francisco in the Santa Cruz Mountains and you wanna find a road, you go to the top of the ridge. They're not at the bottom of the ridge. Now that's a generalization and that generalizes over all of the differences between these ridges and so on and so forth. Um, generalizations of the sort that fit into logical inference require letting go of massive amounts of detail. But what about the ridge that in fact we identified in that picture or the ridge that I climb up in order to find a road or something like that. Think of the ridge is in those waterfall plots. Even if I register it as an, as an object by abstracting away from the details, the ridge itself is not thereby abstracted. And the referent of the phrase that ridge is not necessarily abstracted either. So if I say, look, I'm gonna climb that ridge and you say, look, you're never gonna make it you may be referring to the richness of the ridge itself, not to the richness of it registered as a ridge. Um, go back to that picture of whitewater I had at the beginning. Um, 
if you argue that, I mean, another part of philosophy is uh, talks about issues of vagueness that words like rapid or eddy or something are vague because maybe there's no facts, no absolute facts in the matter as to how many rapids or eddies or something there are in that picture. But again, the vagueness, if it's, I think it's mistake to call it vagueness, but even if it were okay to call it vagueness, um, there's nothing vague about the river. If you're paddling down that river and your life's at stake, there's nothing, you don't run into anything vague. You run into extremely concrete detail. Um, what's vague, if anything, is, is our epistemic description of it as a eddy or a rapid or something like this. And more, 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 more importantly, it's interesting that if you want to actually act, if you want to put your finger just there where the wind is strongest or track the pattern of animal motion against a background of grasses or slip through a crack in the wall or something, then the rich detail is necessary for fine grain action. In other words, the superfluity of detail because it's so detailed, is not good for long distance reasoning and planning or inference, but it's absolutely necessary for action. So suppose I want to reach for a cup here of coffee, which I don't have, but unfortunately. And I say, okay, I'm going to pick up this cup. And I reach out. Now, if you look at slow motion videos of this kind of stuff, it's kind of remarkable. I may think that I'm going to pick up the cup, that that's a conceptual thought. And it may be that the conceptual thought leads my hand in that direction. But as I get close to it, there are subconceptual representations that kind of take over and adjust my fingers and my hand and orient my hand and so on and so forth through non-conceptual representations so as to be prepared to more exactly know how they should pick the cup up so that I don't dump it. And the same thing for serving tennis or leaning in the corner on a motorcycle or something. So to try to wrap up here a little bit, Representing or otherwise dealing with the local ever so rich feature array or, or, or even more stupefying detail in the world is good for controlling action and good for responding to fine detail, but it's bad for long distance inference and generality. This leads to a picture of what I call metaphysical monism, but ontological pluralism. Because what happens is we people, or maybe other creatures too, live in a continuous creative tension between the incredible richness of the world and the long distance utility of language abstraction and inference on the other. When we engage with the world, we wanna do the opposite of abstraction. We wanna kind of reconcile or concretize our ideas with respect to reality to let more of the world's ineffable details fill our representations in order to be appropriately responsive in action um, to the world's fine grain fine grace detail. But when we want to travel long distances, by which I mean maybe conceptual long distances, we want to figure out where, in fact, we're going to, what mine in northern Canada we can go into, where the neutrino flux will be the highest when the sunspot arrives or whatever. In order, then we have to, in fact, um, to do science, we have to let go of a lot of detail and employ spare or more efficient methods purposely designed for inferential travel. And if we're clever, and we're damn clever, I think there's nothing more important about AI than it teaches you humility. We must in fact do both, basically living in this middle realm between engaging with the detail, letting go of the detail, allowing different forms of representation, conceptual or not, and so on and so forth, to, to allow us both to think and to act. And I sometimes think of Objects, properties, and relations. In other words, the conceptual material of ontology, the, the material of conceptual ontology. I think of the objects, properties, and relations, the things we started with, as the long distance trucks and interstate highway systems of intentional normative life, undeniably essential to overall integration of life's practices, crucial given finite resources for us to integrate the vast open ended terrain of experience into a single cohesive objective world. But the cost of packaging them up for portability and long distance travel is that it insulates them from the extraordinary fine great richness of the particular indigenous life, the ineffable richness of the very lives they sustain. And what's magic about us is that we live this dance between them and among them so as to both live and be able to think. Okay, so that's, that's the end of part four. And uh,
if I have two more minutes, um, I'm just going to say this epilogue, um, which I think is kind of interesting. This think about AI, contemporary AI systems, right? They end up doing inference, which is not obviously conceptual. And you know, you end up with vectors, you know, thousand ten thousand dimensional vectors or something with real numbers and so on and so forth. And it just you have this incredible richness. There's a huge amount of pressure to make explicable, right, to explain these things, which basically means, look, render these judgments into conceptual form. And I think part of the picture I'm arguing is, look, that's you've got to be careful about that. I know Priya when I see her, and I think if I ran into her in the streets of Miami where I didn't expect her, um, I would say, oh, my God, Priya, you're, you're in Miami. What brings you here? And then if somebody comes up behind me and says, how do you know that's Priya? I haven't a bloody clue. Because my recognition of Priya as Priya is, in fact, not conceptually available to me. It's probably not actually in conceptual form at all, because I probably don't have concepts that are actually adequate to the detail that I use to, in fact, recognize this particular person. So how do we explain? Well, I've got one more slide. Here's a very short sentence, just 23 words. It's the first sentence of uh, Henry James' Portrait of a Lady, which for some reason I remembered all my life. Under certain circumstances, there are few hours in life more agreeable than the hour dedicated to the ceremony known as afternoon tea. Now think about afternoon tea, about that concept, if you like. What I think is interesting is, <clears throat> you know, our current models of logic would take afternoon tea as referring to the concept of afternoon tea, which is a concept of exemplified by all forms of afternoon tea. But that's not a God-given insight that that's necessarily afternoon tea means or refers to. And you can think of James as actually very clever. And you know Steinbeck's another author who's amazing at this, just with a few words, can actually lead a concept to, in fact, have a specificity that absolutely transcends our ability to get at it with a single word. And from AI point of view, you can see how this might work. If you, if you get all of the other variables arranged in such a way that they can sort of focus in on what it is that this concept is getting at in this particular circumstance that you're, in fact, abstracting in certain sorts of ways, I actually think it might be an inspiration as to how to explain things. So if you said to some medical system, um, look, what do you think we should do? Why are you prescribing this drug, anxiety drug or something? And imagine the system saying, well, look, it's as if this guy was told that they were about to experience a huge shock, as if waiting for a diagnosis after surgery, but they actually have only the vaguest premonition of what it's going to be about. Or she's going to be in a she's in a state reminiscent of the one that her sister experienced after sailing single handedly across the Roaring Forties on her solo trip to Antarctica. Or so. Go back to what Nunberg said about how the chopping up of narrative into corpuscular bits at the beginning of the age of information gave us this notion of corpuscular recombinable recombinable um, um, corpuscular data that somehow we're trying to mine it for the richness of the world. That might be wrong. It might be that we need to realize that novels and poetry and letters and that it's narrative is actually a locus of the understanding that fine tunes things in such a way that you can get a better sense of the richness of the world that these things are about. And what would be the consequence of actually taking that on board as an epistemic ontological assumption for the future of AI. Um, I don't know. But I appreciate your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Brian, for this absolutely wonderful talk, um, addressing so many important deep issues in um, what constitutes conceptual understanding and therefore informs inferences therefrom. Um, that was a real- Well, right, sorry, can I interrupt already? <laughs> Priya knows that I'm not easily shut up. Um, <laughs> our current models of inference are right. conceptual. Right. And I think that the intriguing possibility is that second wave AI, although we don't understand how, 
is showing this inference may actually not need to be conceptual. And we may not know how to explain it, but it may show us that inference can in fact occupy other places in this realm. So I just think, I mean, I don't think you probably disagree with that. I just think it's interesting. No, I don't disagree with that, right. So, uh, no, I know with you that I have to be extra careful with the language, <laughs> right? So you always catch me out every time. So I want to, um, why don't I start off with uh, one sort of question, burning question that I have, and then open it up to the floor. So I invite everyone to please start typing in your questions um, in the chat. So I um, I noted when you mentioned, you know, generalizations, right? So generalizations require discarding details, right? And, and hence information, right? And I wonder how this impacts what we can infer from generalized data, right? Do we lose um, or do we capture? Um, <clears throat> so um, do we manage to, um, do we efficiently capture what is really needed to robustly infer or well, first of all, I think there's no doubt that generalizations are articulated with respect to what I would call registration schemes, which in fact ignore lots of details in order to get at higher level regularities and so on. Sorry. Um, when we put those things in, um, in our system, as it were, we may have other details. So if you think about, um, I mean, really some quite politically problematic systems that have determined, you know, recidivism rates as to who should actually be allowed out of prison and who should not, or chances of success in college, you know, and you know all kinds of other things about this person, such as their... <clears throat> median income and the nature of the neighborhood they're in and the racial profile of the, neighbor, the neighborhood. <clears throat> if we were doing inference in a classical way, which is say a conceptual way, we might actually just <clears throat> base that decision, let's say about whether they should be admitted to Yale um, on their grades or something like that. But if you train an AI system, it's gonna use all of the other detail that it has. And that's probably not a conceptually formulated filter. And the worry is that to some extent, well, of course there are lots of worries. One is that the result will be heinous in a whole variety of ways that it'll re-inscribe, you know, it'll re-inscribe biases that are already there. <clears throat> People struggle with fairness. They put in protected categories and so on and so forth. But you know that's a that's a very tough thing to do. I mean, I mean, it's not tough to. I mean, people do it, but it, but but ethically, it's kind of complex to, in fact, protect certain categories because that's a form of prejudice, also. Um, and I think that the challenge of these systems. I mean, one way to understand the challenge of these systems, if you read these books like um, <clears throat> Weapons of Mass Destruction and um, you know, um, a book I prefer actually, um, the, 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 by Brian Christian, what's it called? Um, anyway, um, oh, yeah, I, I've the read yeah, the, the alignment from the, they document all kinds of problems and sure enough, these are problems, but, but, but what's going on with these problems? Um, well, I think partly, you know, in the fact that you can't necessarily, you might think, look, I'm not going to put the person's racial background or something, um, in this explicit variable, and then these systems can figure it out anyway. <clears throat> we don't quite know how to deal with the richness in this statistical data with all of the parameters, right? Doesn't um, GPT-3 have something like 1.5 billion parameters? Yes. Yeah. You know, what the hell does that mean? And and. But GPT-3 is uncanny. Um, I went in as an exercise. Yeah, yeah. That because I've published a lot that's out in the world, I said, in the style of Priya, right. argue for X. Yeah. It was stunning. I was stunned. And yeah. it really could have been my words. Um, 
And yeah. well, so I, I mean, it is stunning. I think even the um, the the conversation that was published with Lambda, um, um, this uh, bot at Google, which the creator thought was consciousness and conscious and got fired and so on and so forth. <laughs> It's really stunning. I, I mean, if my parents were still alive, I would have them read it. It's like, oh my God, this can in fact happen. Now, one question is, you know, what's going on with those systems? Should we trust them and so on and so forth? Do they know what the hell they're talking about and stuff? That's not this talk. That's more what the promise book that I wrote a couple of years ago is about. And I think the answer is no. This is where I think Gibru's notion of statistical parrots actually applies, which is that you've written enough, enough. I mean, the space, the space of possibilities of the construction of human sentences is, you know, is stupefyingly large. The number that have been said is of measure zero compared to that. You've charted a certain sub-region of this thing. It can be have certain kinds of patterns and, and these systems can recognize them and stuff. But I trust what you say. I'm not going to trust, at least I damn well better not trust a system that is merely mimicking your speech patterns. You know, I want to know what you care about, what you stand for, what you would go and stand in front of a bulldozer for. You know, if a building were building, were burning down, what would you in fact do, even if you never statistically run into the situation before? And so, on. so those ethical situations, I think, are, are outside the can of these systems. But imitating the style, you know... It's damn impressive, and I think it's doing it because it's doing inference, sort of non-conceptual inference over these details because computers can handle a lot of data. But we need to understand that it's non-conceptual. We need to understand what's the world like such that it's, in fact, getting this data. What was the origin of this data? You know, if we've got something in there about how many young people smoke, and it turns out that the data come from American Airlines, and you're only a young person if you're you're an adult if you're over two because you need your own seat. You know, all these questions about the categories, the norms of the categories. That's 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 the kind of question that I think. Anyway, I'm trying to sort of suggest the 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 intellectual arsenal of forms of understanding we need in order to understand what it is that these systems are doing, not just to be impressed by them, because otherwise we're going to be too bloody impressed by them. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of questions. The first one is from Peter Morgan, and he says, this perhaps a process or algorithm that renders non-conceptual life slash living into conceptual form. But I think you say one has to be careful about that process. I suppose we can have a non-conceptual sense of how we render the algorithms that perform the render, but can we render that algorithm itself? Is this a reasonable question, given that this leads to a recursion? Well, okay, another glass of something to drink. Uh I would need to understand what you mean by an algorithm that renders, actually forget the algorithm for the moment. I'd like to know what you mean by rendering non-conceptual life and living into conceptual form, because that would suggest assessing a, 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 a life, I guess, a life process or something of probably ineffable richness, and in fact, abstracting it in such a way that it's fitting into a set of concepts. And I would want to know whose concepts those are, are they yours? Are they the systems itself? Even if they're the systems itself, that doesn't prove that that exhausts the life because I think most of our life, we, in fact, most of our thinking is, in fact, not conceptual in form, I think. Um, you know, if you're driving down the, uh, if we're driving in a car down the highway and I am driving and I say, actually, uh, sorry, I've just been struck completely blind but I'll keep driving, you just tell me what to do. Um, you ought to be scared out of your mind um, because I can't, you can't say, look, turn a little bit to the right or turn 27 degrees to the left. That's not gonna actually lead me to do the right thing and at what speed and so on and so forth. Um, I think most of our physical navigation is in fact um, navigated in terms of subconceptual representations. Um, 
So I don't think you can I don't think you can render non-conceptual living systems into conceptual form unless you're in an artificial life situation or something like that. And I think that's one of the things that makes those things inexorably and indelibly artificial. Um, conceptual representation is 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 lossy, right? It 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 does and it has to, and it's important because it does lose enormous amounts of a detail in order to get at higher level regularities. The life can't, in fact, let go of these of details or it would die. So, so yeah, I just don't actually understand, I guess, what um, rendering a non-conceptual life into conceptual form would mean other than describing it in conceptual terms. And I think it's a theorem that if you describe a non-conceptual life in conceptual terms, you're going to be missing a lot of detail. Sorry, I don't mean to be obstructionist, but I, but I, but I would need to know what's going on better in order to know if we can answer it. So we can move on to uh, the next question by Jun Luo. So the implication of this view for inference is the question. Does it mean that inference uh, cannot be adequately licensed conceptually? That is, if P given even P and P greater than Q entailing Q is not automatic or autonomous, but rather requires non-conceptual orientation to what P and Q are actually about. Likewise, the example of recognizing Priya and Miami, which AI practitioners today do call inference, seems to suggest that the warrant of such inference is non-conceptual with the non-conceptual aspects of yeah. quickly. Well, I think, um... I think that yes. So, so take the p and p and tails q um, or implies q um, if we go syntactic. Um, there are reasonable conditions in this reasonable conditions underlying even conceptual inference of that sort, which I think even a logician would recognize, which in fact limit the application of that. So for example, um, you know, sorties paradoxes and so on and so forth. If P is standing next to Q, then P is near Q, but Q is standing next to R, then Q is near R. But if you do that for 10,000 people, then in fact, P is not near the person who's 10,000 away and so on and so forth. So how do you know how far the, these, these sort of partially transitive things go? Um, um, you know, uh, the applicability of, you know, somebody who's young, one year younger than them is also young, and I mean, one year older than them is also young, and all these kinds of things. Um, it's kind of trivial for introductory logic students to come up with examples which violate the norms of of conceptual inference. And I think what the logic teachers typically say is, look, <clears throat> you have to operate within a regimen of reasonableness. The problem is that when we automate this stuff in systems and have you know databases being swallowed up by these systems and so on and so forth, we actually don't know what the reasonable conditions are and so on. Um, you know, this is an ancient example, but when I was in MIT, there was this, uh, you know, as I said, 150 years ago, there was this system of medical diagnosis and it was asked how to cure a a, a, a kidney infection and said, take the kidney out and boil it. Um, now, that system lacks something. And so people tried to axiomatize common sense and they've tried to axiomatize causality and they've tried to axiomatize all these sorts of things. Axiomatization in the classical mold is simply a conceptual rendering of what's going on. And I think the reason that second wave AI has trounced Not necessarily forever. I mean, there's a whole discussion here, but the reason that I think it's kind of trounced classical AI is that, in fact, purely conceptual inference has proved to be inexorably brittle because of the limitations of the conceptual categories. And the improved behavior of these statistical algorithms, I say, I think is because they are not entirely conceptual. That doesn't mean they're the best thing in the world. I don't think, for example, this idea of 
having a system explain itself by constructing literatures which would constrain the categories to mean what it is that they mean in these particular things and so on. This is miles beyond where we are now. But yes, I think there are limits to um, there are limits to uh, to conceptuality. And I think it's important for AI to, like your comment about recognizing pre in Miami is considered inference. Maybe somebody in AI would call that statistical inference. Yeah. Um, what can we trust statistical inference for? That's not. That's a pretty coarse grained label of what's going on. I think. Um, and I think the same issues about statistical inference. I mean, the fact that it's based on this idea of data where the data are these corpuscular things where the assumption is that the instantiation of the properties across lots of different objects and lots of different circumstances is the same property and so on and so forth. I think there, you know, it's an advance over, over GoFi, but I think lots of these issues of homogeneity, um, not knowing the norms that underlie the use of the categories and so on and so forth, they're gonna they're gonna defeat. I mean, uncannily good as they look, I think they're gonna defeat. Um, they're gonna defeat even this even second wave inference. I think it, you know it will be looked at as as narrow as first wave AI inference is looked at now. Thank you. Um, we now have a question from Sylvia who asks, regarding the precision of athletic decisions involved in navigating whitewater rapids, I think you were saying that because we cannot conceptualize the pools and rocks and eddies around a bend, notice that we nevertheless steer and survive without one causal inference. Non-conceptual inference takes the limitations of the programmer's coding out of the equation. I like that, but I'm not a mathematician. How would AI plant a garden? Oh, I love that question. Um, well, first of all, um, yeah, how would AI, I mean, I don't think the word AI has a stable enough reference to enable me to answer the last question, although my initial gut level response was sitting down. Um, but, <laughs> um, but the first thing about uh, you know the skill of of um, of going through these this whitewater with that one causal inference, I think this goes back to Priya's point. It isn't one causal inference in the sense that inference was classically thought about in classical logical terms and AI terms. It probably is an inference in the sense that Jun. Jun Luo was just mentioning that that contemporary statistical AI would actually take it to be causal inference. Um, um, quite possibly continuous, you know, dynamic interaction with an environment in, in ways that honor causal consequences and so on and so forth. Um, I kind of don't doubt that you could build an AI, even kind of at the moment, that could manage a canoe down some of these rivers. Um, I mean, I'm no expert, I'm not a programmer. Um, so I think we have to know better what causal inference means. Um, I mean, Priya was laughing at me, I hope, with respect to my needing words well-defined, um, especially since I don't believe in definitions, but, but the issue of what the words mean, it, you know, matters with respect to this stuff, because in fact, without one causal inference, we need to know what inference is such that it doesn't involve it. And we need to know what inference might mean in the statistical sense, and so on and so forth, in order to know what form of attunement to the causality structure of the world the systems are actually capable of. Non-conceptual interest takes the limitations of the programmer's coding out of the equation. You know, that's very tricky. Um, I uh, I just taught this course on ethics of AI, and, and this issue came up as to whether the programmers are in fact culpable at all for the systems that uh, the results they come up with. Um, and some of the people who actually work with contemporary AI systems say, "Look, the programmers do nothing; they just program in causal, you know, gradient descent among um, huge regions of of you know spaces of continuous variable. And in fact, programming causal descent among them is not doesn't take genius." Um, even if it pays you a lot of money. Um, but there are issues about 
what data you're gathering and so on and so forth, which are pretty tricky. I mean, if you have, you know, a sex, um, you know, a, 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 an entry for sex or something in a database and stuff, you know, are you going to have sex and gender or sex? And is there going to be separate and sex? Is it going to be male or female? Or is it going to be XX or XY or XYY or XXY or X naught? Um, what about people who are XY but don't have androgen receptors and so they grow up phenotypically female and they don't actually realize that they're XY until they possibly get tests for infertility later on and so on and so forth. Then it can be quite shocking for them to discover that they've been XY their whole life and so on. These categories are not innocent. And, you know, and race, of course, is an absolutely not innocent category. When I was a kid, I asked my parents why I was like six or something, why if a black person and a white person had a kid, the kid wasn't splotchy like a Jersey cow or something like this. And, you know, I got laughed at. But but I think the answer was because race is not a biological category, you know, and that's the cat categories aren't innocent. That's what feminist epistemologists and, and, and feminist scientists and so on and so forth have been arguing for so long. These categories are inflected. And partly what I'm trying to do is to, I mean, I don't know if this comes across. I want to do justice to that recognition from the science studies and feminist epistemologists and so on and so forth, even though I'm resolutely realist, because I actually think this stupefying, surpassing detail of the world is actually the same. And if I and someone else register it in different ways, it's the same detail that we're in fact abstracting in various ways that suit our particular cultural assumptions and norms and so on and so forth. I mean, so and Brian, is this is this not much more salient when we are thinking of like standard, you know, bottom of the barrel machine learning tasks, for example, where we provide a training set. So the choice of training set, not only what data we collect, but what we choose as the training yeah, set. Well, just, right, and how the how the training set was gathered, um, and on and on and on. Yeah, this is this is um, um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we uh, Peter has another quick comment uh, and a question. You mentioned that there is a lossiness in how we think about life. It, thought is a compression. Is this question? Well. <laughs> Yes, I think it's a compression in a way. Um, I mean, it's tricky because the word compression comes from information theory, and the idea is that there's information there, and you know, and the and the and the measures of information, in fact, buy into these conceptual assumptions and so on and so forth in lots of ways. So, so, so there's um, there's um, there's problems with circularity in the foundation of the question. Um, um, I do think that thought is lossy to some extent, but I think that. Remember I said we live in this middle distance between the detail and the abstractions and stuff and we navigate them and we take ethical responsibility, moral responsibility for the abstractions we have to, I mean, we should anyway, and navigating them and so on and so forth and understanding how they would go into practice and, and stuff. And so if I say to a surgeon, look, you've got to, um, oh, Adam, here's a real example from the beginning of at Xerox Park when we first made, um, windows and mice and the question was how fast the mice the mouse should track the you know the cursor should track the mouse and somebody wrote off a paper saying it was i don't know whatever 3.5 inches per uh, on the screen compared to an inch on the on the on the on the, on the uh, pad or something like that and it turns out that's not what matters what matters is you want to be able to cross the whole screen with a single rotation of the wrist <coughs> Um, the, well, I guess the point is, it, 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 it's sort of the same one that there's assumptions in the categories, um, in terms of which we, um, 
construct these non-conceptual representations and so on and so forth that we as programmers kind of need to take responsibility for. Um, and if things are as Prius says, and in fact, a lot of the problems are in how the data is collected and what the data assumes and so on and so forth. The, um, you know, and students I had in classes, we this semester didn't think the systems were capable of taking ethical responsibility at all. That didn't even occur to them because they don't have this model of AI that we had four years ago and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's a mess, it's a mess. Um, I mean, I would say yes. Um, thinking is 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 loses a lot. Um, but but good thinkers know how to take responsibility for that which the thoughts lose. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Thank you. So Gary has the next question. What is the implication of scale? For example, a concept of a person is fuzzy, but what about the concept of a photon or a gravitational field? A star is a fuzzy concept, but the fields created by the star is precise. Well, okay, so here's a problem, possibly with me. I have never understood what people say when they say concepts are fuzzy. I may just lack the right gene, um, but I've had arguments with this with, I remember John Holland and John McDowell and and a bunch of other people at Chicago at the time. Um, is it that, for example, a person being fuzzy, does it mean that there are edge cases which we don't know how to judge? Does it mean there are individual edge cases that are hard to judge, but that we don't actually... Um, I mean, one possibility is that we don't know how to define it, even though in a particular case, we would know how to how to use it. Um, maybe we don't have to, don't know how to apply it in detail, like bread, you know, let's say we have, let's say, uh, let's have the opposite of bread for supper. And somebody can say, how can we have the opposite of bread, right? So what's bread? Is it hot cross buns? Is it bagels? Is it latkes? Is it, you know, naan or chapatis or, I mean, God knows what. Um, but is that fuzzy? Like, I'm not sure it's fuzzy. It's just not clearly applicable. And it's, it's grab on reality is maybe, you know, looser. Mm -hmm. um, a star is a fuzzy concept. I guess you mean by that, that um, um, <clears throat> maybe what kinds of fusion you need in a, in a, system you know there could be levels of fusion which don't raise it to actually being a star and this kind of stuff maybe there are there are conjoined star systems which are so close that it's not actually clear if it's one star or two that would be another case of maybe beauty so the fields created by the star is precise that's an interesting point because one of the things that i think is true about computer science um and to some extent by physics too, is that we are used to dealing with systems at an enormously wide variety of scales. You know, I mean, I think computer science, it regularly crosses um, like 15 orders of magnitude of scale from, from picosecond junction transit times to running times of Ethereum um, mining. Um, systems and so on and so forth. And some of the categories that apply at some levels don't apply at others. So for example, it might be that the features or the properties, I think they might be features that in fact have precise boundaries at very low levels. When you put them together in this complexity, you end up at high levels without there being completely precise, you know. So take being a, being a, an implementation of PDF reading. That's surely fuzzy in some sense in the PDF standard is nobody actually uh, implements it completely. And you're gonna have things maybe for Microsoft, which in fact do a reasonable job, but in fact, violate lots of cases. And maybe they accept cases which are not part of the PDF, but then practice goes with what Microsoft does rather than with the specification. And then it becomes true that if you write it to the specification, it may not be accepted as a PDF by Microsoft. You know, or by Adobe Acrobat or whatever it is. 
What happens to precise precision as you cross scale boundaries is, well, I think that ought to be taught in high school. I, I think these issues of scale, yeah, how to think with scale are, are hugely important. And um, I mean, the implication of scale is we should think hard about it and think about what properties cross scale boundaries and which ones don't. Um, maybe that's my answer. Leave and, the fuckiness aside. Right. So I think um, at this time, we, we probably have time for just one more question before we wrap up. And if Brian is willing, people can stay on a little bit after uh, officially to continue the Q&A. Uh, so we have this question from Niels, um, who says, your examples seem to be only on our perception and or um, conception of the physical world. Would your analysis also be applicable to the social world and concepts like democracy or justice and social roles like being a judge? A person either is or is not a judge, which to me seems a bit different from the Ridge example. Do you agree? And if you do, what are the consequences for the generality of your arguments? Oof, big question. Well, yeah, fortunately I know Niels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say they do apply. I think the, the case, I mean, this goes back to Priya's question early on about, look, we have to have a social agreement or, or, or even determination of hack with respect to category boundaries. I think category boundaries is, um, if you'll forgive me an analogy, I kind of think of categories as, as in the classical model as being viewed as like square waves in the following sense. They, they are thought to have sharp boundaries like the edges of the square wave. So something either is or is not a judge, as you say. And then they're thought to have flat tops in the sense that the, 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 the being a judgeness of a given judge is the same being a judgeness as someone else. Um, and I'm not sure that's right. And I think that's one of the sort of assumptions that is, 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 is so deep that I find it very difficult to actually talk to students about what it would be for it not to be the case. <clears throat> but whether a person is or is not a judge, I would doubt that that's so clear. I mean, um, suppose, I don't know, suppose I'm a devout Catholic and I want to actually be married and I'm, I've been hit by a car in an accident and I'm, I'm only got a few hours to live and stuff and I just want a judge to officiate our marriage so that I can be at peace and feel like I won't go to hell or something like this. I'm sorry if I'm stepping all over 86,000 toes doing this but example, but, and somebody says, well, look, I was a judge. I actually, uh, my 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 um, license expired last week. And I say, look, that's all right. I don't care, care about that, right? Um, my partner and I actually don't even agree on whether we're married um, because we had a ceremony with her 95 year old father at the dining room table, the way that was classically done in ancient times. And we exchanged rings and we had promises and so on and so forth. And it was wonderful because at the end of it, he stood up and raised a glass and said, I'm so glad Brian, you've done this because I've always wondered about your intentions. And, um, you know, only somebody 95 could say that with a, a, a smile, I think, um, I, I mean it earnestly and so on and so forth. And now, to some extent, that strikes me as the authentic marriage. It just wasn't the one um, recognized by the state, except in Canada, it is recognized by the state, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, whether someone's a judge or not, I mean, if you want to reduce things to the adequacy of formal documents, then you get to what Nunberg was talking about at the, with the rise of print and the sort of corpuscularization of data. And, you know, that the digital identity criteria of print has, in fact, first of all, recorded social facts, but then actually become used as, in fact, the determinants of the boundaries of these categories. And I'm... Uh, so I, I actually, with with enormous respect um, and with an amount of respect that is not itself formally measurable, I would differ with whether, in fact, judges are or not judges. Um, 
Okay, so I'm uh, really tempted to have one final question included, uh, Brian, and that's from right. uh, Stephen Kokma. Oh, okay. Great talk. Uh, near the end, you made the point that uh, these are not quite your words, um, as he says, representing rich detail is good for action, but bad for long distance inference. But as your examples show, inference requires making the normatively right abstractions that retain the details that matter to the context. This is non-trivial, and I assume you would say that the skill of making context-appropriate abstractions is a form of a non-conceptual skill. But if so, does it mean that we'll uh, never be able to explain the success of a generalized AI if we somehow manage to achieve such a thing? Well, great question. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, I think that, yes, managing the loss in a way that doesn't do violence to what's, um, what matters about the situation um, is absolutely part of wisdom and a part of being an adult, basically. Um, um, I have an enormous respect for that, and I 100% agree that it's non-trivial. And I think one of the things that scares the wits out of me is that we will not only model our AI systems on essentially trivial models of judgment and inference, but then we will raise our children to think that, in fact, doing judgment the way the systems do is constitutes being an adult. And we're going to actually all go down the drain because of our conception of humanity has been torqued by our attempt to build these systems and we're going to lose exactly these non-trivial things. So yes, 100% see you and raise you one on the non-triviality. Whether it's a form of non-conceptual skill, I actually think it probably is. Um, however, your last sentence, I have to, um, I had um, people who worked in my group at Xerox Park 40 years ago or whatever, um, were going to get me vanity license plates when they first came out and the vanity license plate they were going to get me was yes, dot, 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 bet, but. <laughs> which I'm afraid is actually sort of appropriate. <laughs> Does this mean we'll never be able to explain the sets of, of, of a general AI? First of all, I don't think we're going to get a general AI if it, in fact, buys into the current idea of explanation being entirely conceptual. If <laughs> being conceptual is taken to be this particular model of conceptual that, I'm, um, that I've talked about here. Um, The thing I was trying to say in my epilogue comment about explainability is, and actually, I, I mean, throughout the talk, I, I didn't make a big deal of it, but I, about anyone who was alert to it will have noticed. I don't think the use of words is intrinsically conceptual in the sense that I've characterized conceptuality. I think poets and novelists, and not only that, but I think great intellectuals and so on and so forth, use words in ways that outstrip the constrictions on conceptuality that I've that I think have been kind of lionized and brought into formality. I don't think we're going to be able to explain non-conceptual judgments made by even even the sorts of systems like how it is that a system decides that you've got lung cancer or doesn't or is that melanoma or not and so on. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to explain those things if we hang on to the traditional notion of conceptual explanation. That doesn't mean we can't explain them using words. I think this idea of a system that can say, well, look, it's kind of like this. Remember this thing happened to you. Well, you remember the feeling you had then? You know, it's, this person is kind of that state too, but they're also whatever and blah, blah, blah. I mean, think of what a really competent doctor can do with respect to explanation. It's often narrative in form. And I think there's something really weighty and worth pondering about the substance of narrative with respect to explaining in ways that outstrip the model of conceptuality I'm talking about here. And the question is, how will those be implied not only in explaining the success of a general AI, but actually in getting us to a general AI? So see you on Raise You One, that's, that's my answer. Great. Anyway, um, I think at this point, we have kept you way too long, um, Brian. So I want to thank you once again for a wonderful talk.
we look forward to the discussion tomorrow with uh, Professor Rouse at the same time, uh, 3 p.m. as today. And before we close, I want to give thanks to Thai Camp. Uh, without Dr. Camp's help, this entire series could not have been managed uh, at all. So thank you so much, Thai, for everything that you do, and in particular for making this series such a resounding success. Thank you. And to here, Guy, here. yeah, and to Guy, without whose AV help and expertise we would not be able to bring this wonderful set of um, uh, talks to the general public, uh, well, for posterity, whatever posterity means. Uh, with his help uh, and skills, we've been able to put all of these lectures on both our website and the YouTube channel, dedicated YouTube channel. So I invite you all to go take a look. And with this, I want to say thanks once again to Brian and to everyone for attending and helping make this uh, wonderful series uh, such a success. We are hoping to have a conference in person next year in the fall. So watch out for uh, details. Thanks very much.